Okay, so uh, hello everyone to welcome to today's Amusium seminar. Uh, um, we have a treat today. It's absolutely my uh, pleasure to welcome our today's speaker, Paul Cripps. Uh, Paul currently is a full professor in the Department of uh, Physiology and Pharmacology and Medicine in University of Calgary in uh, Canada. So uh, um, Paul actually uh, started his research as a graduate student at Queen's University uh, in the area, uh, particular focus in the area of uh, uh, cardiovascular uh, physiology. Uh, in 1988, he moved to Louisiana State University Medical Center to start a postdoc fellowship, trying to understand why there is a excessive inflammation associated with heart attacks and uh, strokes. Now, uh, Paul then took a position as a assistant, a, uh, as assistant professor uh, at the University of Calgary and continued to investigate the, the uh, machineries, uh, molecular machinery leading to the Y cell uh, recruitment in uh, vasc uh, cardiovascular disorders. Paul and his lab actually identify um, that an endogenously produced gas uh, nitrate oxide um, uh, function to reduce leukocyte recruitment. This work has subsequently uh, branched out into area of infections and autoimmunity. And he was one of the very first one to use this inhale um, NO as a potential therapy, which I think a, a, a significant contribution uh, for both uh, basic research and then clinic application. So uh, Paul was appointed as a Sittler um, a research chair uh, in critical care medicine uh, in Calgary. Uh, more recently, his focus, his lab focus is um, uh, more into uh, imaging the host response to infections with uh, particular interest in how the immune cell system deals with pathogen in blood and uh, or uh, intravascular immunity, which we probably gonna hear a lot of uh, in today's uh, his talk. Um, as I just mentioned, Paul currently is a full, full professor at the University of Calgary uh, in Faculty of Medicine. In uh, addition to that, he also is a AHFMR scientist, a, uh, a Canada Research Chair, and the uh, founding director of the New Siddler Institution of uh, Infection, Immunity, and the um, Inflammation. So uh, based, based on Paul's uh, really significant contribution to the uh, community, he was, uh, have a lot of orders and awards, which I'm not gonna, I'm gonna uh, list all of them, uh, but a few of them he was awarded as uh, uh, Kielman uh, Annual Professor Award and then uh, Gable uh, Kelly Memorial Lectureship uh, in 2019, CSAT uh, VB Scientific Excellent Award in also 2019, Order of the University of um, Calgary, 2023 and also CH fellowship induction uh, also on 2023. So Paul's lab actually extremely, extremely uh, productive. He actually uh, so far published over 300 different publications, over 45,000 uh, citations. I think it's absolutely remarkable. Uh, but I think uh, more than that, I think Paul actually uh, really raised a lot of uh, outstanding students and postdoc who a lot of them um, among these uh, um, students or among these trainees, a lot of them are extremely active in both academia and also industry. I think they have uh, all have a very successful uh, um, career path. So without further ado, uh, Paul, thank you so much for uh, doing this lecture for us. Uh, we are very much looking for your talk. Thank you. Okay, well, thank you very much. Um, and I'll be honest, I wasn't sure uh, what to expect. I, you know, I heard words like casual, relaxed, uh, uh, you know, it's a, a sort of a fun se a seminar series. And so I thought about it a long time. And I'm, what I'm going to do is I'm going to tell you two stories. And the first one has been published, and it's been published for a number of years. But it's what's coming out of it that's uh, and, and the questions that were raised from those publications that we're working on avidly now. And we're trying to understand the biology behind it. And so I'll, you know, segue every so often to say, OK, this is what we're studying now. And uh, here are the big hurdles. So that's the first part. The second part is more of a work in progress. We're trying to understand how the immune system is actually affected by the environment. So rather than study how the immune system affects the environment, we're now going to look at how does the environment affect uh, the immune system. I'll use the macrophage as a prototype for that second part of the talk. So um, 
So um, you, you already mentioned the idea of intravascular immunity. Uh, many years ago, we we thought about what is it that we do as a collective? And we realized we do a lot of work around what happens in blood vessels, what happens around blood vessels, how does the immune system interact with the uh, vasculature? And so we coined this term intravascular immunity. And as you know, this is a very dynamic process, many things go on. And so taking a single snapshot is just not good enough. We need to see what's happening. And so for that, we have developed all kinds of systems to try and image and visualize what's happening in a very dynamic immune system. And so we use microscopes where we set them up so that the mouse is on a stage. We never ever take any cells out of this mouse. And we try and do as little to the mouse as possible because anything affects uh, immunity. And so we'll take antibodies uh, and we'll inject them into the tail vein. And those antibodies are directed against specific cell types. So for example, I6G on neutrophils. Um, and so we then look at just neutrophils if that's what we're interested in. If we're interested in something like the liver, we do a laparotomy and the liver just sits on a stage inside the mouse. And then we can just visualize the liver without taking it out of the mouse, without perturbing blood flow or anything else. And then we use different types of, uh, of um, microscopy. We can use spinning disc if we want to capture really rapid events, or we can use two photon microscopy if we're measuring various things, uh, for example, collagen, if we're measuring uh, deeper into tissues, et cetera, et cetera. And I'll show you examples of that. Now, if you take the liver, for example, uh, the blood flow comes from the uh, intestinal tract. It percolates through these tiny sinusoids, and then it leaves again. And these kind of pictures show you the vasculature, they'll show you the hepatocytes, but they don't show you the amazing activity that actually happens inside the liver when it comes to the immune system. And I think the immune system is just a part of the physiology of an organ. It lives there and it integrates and it functions in a very effective way. And so here are the blue sinusoids I just showed you. Here are dull green hepatocytes. And then if you start injecting antibodies against, for example, macrophage, so an, so an antibody against F480, you see these giant purple cells come into view. They're sitting inside the vasculature and they, they're probably the largest population of macrophage in the body. Depending on what you label is what you see. And, and I know that's intuitive, but many people say, oh, I don't see any T cells. But if you have a transgenic, for example, for INK T cells, they are certainly there and they're patrolling throughout the vessels looking around for perturbations, for tumors, for uh, infections. And so you always have all these different cells in these organs, and you really have to be um, careful when you suggest that they may not be there, even under basal conditions. Now, if you add bacteria to the system, you can see how effectively those large macrophages, the Kupfer cells, will catch a bacterium like methicillin resistant Staph aureus, so staph infections, the, the, the macrophage are excellent at catching these, uh, these bacteria. It's a very rapid event. And so for this, you need to use imaging to really understand how that's all happening. We can, we can actually visualize any organ uh, as long as it's accessible. So the most challenging things that we do are things like the brain, like the brain, the, the, the heart, the lung. And so for that, we now use these uh, special little um, uh, uh, windows with a suction cup. And so as the mouse is breathing, we put the window on top, there's a little bit of suction and that mobilizes the, uh, the uh, lung in place. The animal's breathing, the, animal, uh, the blood flow's normal, and we begin to visualize what's happening in and around these, uh, these alveoli. And so it allows us now to again, begin to assess what does that organ look like? And again, if you take a look, you'll see that the lung has an immune system already in place. And in this particular case, you're looking at blue neutrophils 
constantly patrolling inside these red capillaries surrounding these alveoli. So those neutrophils are always in place. They're always moving around. Um, they're, they're actually attached and crawling through these capillaries patrolling. And if you now look at the neutrophils in yellow and you add a little bit of bacteria, the bacteria get caught, but there are no macrophageal kupfer cells in the vasculature. Who takes care of the problem is these yellow neutrophils. You can see them leap across, catch these bacteria and devour them. And so we think that each immune system, each organ has its own immunity, its own immune system to deal with whatever uh, it needs to deal with. Now those are infections and we're also quite interested in sterile injury. And so this is injury that happens um, because of some perturbation. And I would argue that most sterile injury is caused by our lifestyles. So whether it be drinking, smoking, uh, eating fatty foods, these are all things that lead to lifestyle uh, like perturbations. And we actually coined the term lifestyle associated molecular patterns because they sometimes are and sometimes aren't part of the body. Uh, and they induce uh, problems with uh, which cause all kinds of pro um, all kinds of uh, uh, immune responses, and it's no wonder if you're, for example, smoking and you're inhaling all these toxins. The macrophage tries to do the best it can to clear some of these substances, but obviously it's not uh, it's not optimal. It may release proteases that may lead to further lung infection, and so under these conditions, you often get an inappropriate immune response. Now there's another kind of sterile injury, and this is the one we've been studying probably for 20 years now. And the one I actually, uh, when I titled this talk, I said simple models. And I really wanna talk about how complex an immune response we have in response to a very simple injury. And that injury is really just uh, trauma, okay? And so we have learned to deal with trauma. If you get, impaled with something, or if you get a sliver, the body knows how to deal with that. It's been millions of years of evolution to develop the most appropriate healing response. And what's really interesting is that 99% of scientists are studying this, not this. People don't care about trauma. People don't really, it's not all that interesting. You know, so you get a bruise, you get an injury. It's not all that interesting. And so we thought this is what we need to study. Something really simple and try and understand how the immune system behaves in this simple model before we try and understand things like autoimmunity or, you know, so, some of these other very difficult models. And so this model, it's a model of optimal repair, if you will. So what we do is we injure with just a physical injury, as I'll show you. And then within 14 days, we can't find that injury. It's completely healed. And it's what processes have led to that repair process. And I'll tell you that any disruption we have ever tried, blocking a particular immune cell, blocking a particular chemokine, has never led to improvement. It has always led to, uh, us, uh, to us messing up things. And so this is an example of where the immune system works beautifully and it doesn't need help from us. And that model is the following, okay? And it can be applied to any tissue anywhere. We take a thermal probe and we lower it to the liver and we kill about a thousand cells. We add propidium iodide and what that does is it lights up the dead cells, okay? And so now you've got red dead cells. And 20 years ago, we asked, will the immune system actually notice death? So do we notice our own dead cells? Do we care? And the green are neutrophils. And I think you'll agree that the immune system notices. And it notices probably as effectively, if not more effectively, than if this was an infection. So death, for some reason, is a stimulus, a very important danger signal that begets immunity, okay? It drives, in this particular case, neutrophils to this site. 
Now, I will tell you that in this model, we've shown that monocytes come in after the neutrophils, I and K T cells surround the area. They start pumping out IL-4 to make this a more TH2-like response. Macrophages come in uh, and help tweak this system. And we're studying eosinophils and their role. So there is an incredible array of cells that come into this site. And I'm just going to tell you a little bit about the neutrophil, just to show you how you can take a very simple model and uncover some pretty important things. And so in this model, we followed each of these neutrophils and we immediately saw that this guy and this guy and this guy and this guy, they're all running towards this injury site. There's a chemotaxis at play here. These cells are migrating towards the injury. Something's calling them to come there. And so um, a number of years ago now, we published this paper where we said, look, there are molecules outside of the cells that shouldn't be there, things like ATP. And when you get injury, ATP activates inflammasome, begets production of various molecules. You get these neutrophils adhering tightly, running along the sinusoids, the endothelium, coming to a site where there's the injury and then migrating into this injury site. Before we can even put the mouse up on the microscope, platelets have covered this area between the injury and the, the blood vessel. So platelets come in and they adhere to the injured endothelium. And now the neutrophils can crawl along these platelets to the site of injury. Interestingly, you have chemokine gradients that form and these cells run along these chemokine gradients. When you get perturbations of the vasculature, that chemokine gradient gets disrupted, but other molecules form new chemokine gradients. So there's a hierarchy of chemokine gradients, if you will, that then say, you need to come in here, ignore this chemokine gradient and come into this site. And so there's, there's this idea in immunology that there's one chemokine and it drives cells recruitment over thousands and thousands of, uh, of microns. That just doesn't happen. You can't set up a gradient that that's, that that's that long. So we set up multiple chemokine gradients to get neutrophils to sites of injury. And in this particular case, what was interesting was that it was dying cells releasing formulated peptide from their mitochondria that allowed these neutrophils now to say, okay, there's formulated peptides, we have to go there. Now, as you know, formulated peptides are usually made by bacteria. Mitochondria are ancient bacteria. They make the same sort of signal, neutrophils go there. So based on that, and the fact that the neutrophil has always been thought to be a killing machine, we've guessed that probably the neutrophils are going in there to cause further injury. And we couldn't have been further from the truth. But nonetheless, the neutrophil was shown to be very potent at killing bacteria. It made lots of oxidants, proteases, even releasing its chromatin as neutrophil extracellular traps. And all of these things contribute to killing. And so, you know, people say if you're a hammer, everything's a nail. And so obviously if this neutrophil sees something, it's going to try and kill it. And that was the that that was what we were, you know, expecting. And in fact, it's what the reviewer said. You're, you have to show that the neutrophils are killing and causing more injury. And I'll tell you, uh, it took us another seven years. Uh, um, to actually publish the next paper. And Jing Wang uh, took this on as a postdoc when she was with me. And she said, you know, I'm not so sure that neutrophils are actually uh, causing more injury. And so what we decided to do was to actually test this hypothesis. And so what we did was we started trying to image inside this area of injury. So the green is just cytox green. So it's just, it's just a dye that tells us that the cell's now permeable, dying. And so we have uh, uh, lit up the nuclei. You can see around this injury, there's beautiful vasculature, blood vessels. And if you follow these blood vessels into the injury, you can clearly see these blood vessels are completely collapsed now. And so if you inject FITC albumin shown here, it turns all of these blood vessels purple, it accumulates around the injury, but it does not flow inside these vessels. These vessels are dead, they have been killed. And so now the question is, 
what do this, does the neutrophil do there? We've killed everything, so surely it can't kill it again. And so we started watching these neutrophils and realized that they begin to surround <coughs> these blood vessels, okay? And so they surround all these blood vessels. And then if you watch them, they begin to dismantle these red blood vessels. So the blue are the neutrophils. You can see them here ripping apart all these dead vessels. Here they've completely cleared up the vessels. And if you look, a number of these neutrophils now are not quite blue anymore because they've taken up a lot of this particle. And so they're actually starting to clear these areas. And in fact, if you look a little bit later, what you see is that they're moving back and forth, back and forth. We think they're clearing those areas that have been designed areas for vasculature, and they're actually helping to make new vasculature. They're clearing those sleeves so that you can now start growing new vasculature so that you can now start regenerating the, uh, the liver, the injury that we've caused. These neutrophils here in red then begin to notice all these green dead nuclei and they begin to dismantle all of that and they eat up all of these, uh, this chromatin, uh, dead particles. They're very good at scavenging and clearing. So think of an old house, you wanna build a new house, you're not gonna build it on top of the old house. That would never work. So what you do is you clear the whole area and that's what the neutrophils do. You build a foundation and you put up a new house. And, and so the first thing we see that happens is that normally every tissue obviously has collagen. And at the time of injury, we've gotten rid of all that collagen. And what happens over the next four days is a beautiful basement membrane gets built. So this is using two, harmo uh, two photon uh, microscopy and using second harmonic. And we can see this beautiful uh, laying down of collagen, okay? If you deplete neutrophils, even for the first day, we don't get this beautiful collagen deposition. Now there's two issues here. One is either the neutrophil doesn't clear, if because it's not there, it doesn't clear all the crap here. And so you can't lay down new foundation or else. And there's a number of people that have hinted at this now, uh, it, the neutrophil may be putting down collagen itself and that's helping to uh, cause the repair. And so it'll be very interesting to work out. And this is what we're trying to work out now is, is the neutrophil simply clearing things or does it actually put down collagen itself? Once you lay down the collagen, then these red blood vessels begin to grow inwards and you start getting a nice uh, healing response so that at seven days or so, you're still seeing a little bit of injury. And by 14 days, this is all gone. If you get rid of neutrophils and you look at seven days, your injury is still pretty large. Those neutrophils haven't had a chance to clear the area and now your revascularization isn't as good. So this is all interesting. Um, and if you take a look in the literature, uh, everyone will tell you that neutrophils then die. They go to a site, they die. And that's based on a lot of work from infectious models where neutrophils go in, they clear bacteria, and then they die there, okay? And so, Okay, so we look to see what happens to neutrophils and indeed neutrophils reach very high levels already at 12 hours. By 24 hours, there's this dramatic drop off of neutrophils and 48 hours later, they're all gone. And so neutrophils do come in, uh, they, they do their effector functions, which is actually looks more like healing than it is like killing. And then they, they seem to disappear, okay? Now, <clears throat> Pathology textbooks tell us macrophage come in and they eat up all these neutrophils, okay? So in this case, we calculated that probably one macrophage for a, every 100 to 500 neutrophils. That's some challenging eating, if you ask me, uh, but nonetheless. Um, and then we watched red monocytes, blue neutrophils, and while they were each doing something, we didn't see overt uptake, overt monocytes taking up neutrophils. Okay, so that was the first thing that said, geez, 
This doesn't seem to align with the literature very well. We took the CCR2 knockout mouse. Now this mouse keeps all of its monocytes in the bone marrow. The monocytes can't get to the injury site. And so there's no monocytes there. And yet the neutrophils dis dis disappear just as effectively. If you deplete all neutrophils macrophage in the system using clodridate liposomes, the disappearance of neutrophils is identical whether you have macrophage there or not. And so this for the first time really got us thinking, this just is not what, what, what the textbooks say. And so we went back to the literature and it's amazing if you read, you actually can probably uncover just about anything you're thinking about. And this was worked for originally from Anna Houghton Lager. Uh, I think it's one of the most uh, amazing papers. It wasn't published in Science, Nature, Cell. It was published in Journal of Bio Leukocyte Biology, and it's a tremendous paper. And you don't always have to publish in science to get wonderful papers. And this paper, uh, it took a zebrafish embryo, and it burnt or cut the fin. And then what they watched was neutrophils come running out, inspect the injury, turn around, and jump back into the vasculature. And the videos are just spectacular of this event. Subsequently, Suzanne Norshark uh, published a couple of papers saying that, you know, at the very least, neutrophils can stick their pseudopods out, look around, and then transmigrate back into the tissue. And so we wondered in our model, is this what's happening? And so we built a mouse where we took photoactivatable GFP. So you shine light, 405 nanometers, and you get a beautiful uh, GFP signal. And if you put it on a neutrophil specific Cree, you end up with a mouse where if you shine light, the neutrophils glow. So what we did was we went to this area, we shone light, uh, UV light, and this area now became fluorescent. Here's healthy tissue, here's damaged tissue, and so these neutrophils are clearly in the damaged area. And we asked, what do they do when they're done their job? And what we observed was the red are the healthy vessels. Each one of these green cells now starts migrating back into the vasculature and leaving. And here's another one, here's another one, here's another one, here's another one. It's a lineup ready to leave. And so these neutrophils, they actually find their way back into the vasculature. And people phone me up and they say, Coobs, we don't see this. And I say, how long did you look for? And they say, two to four hours. And I say, yeah, we don't see it either. It doesn't happen until the cell has finished its job, whether it be killing, whether it be uh, uh, you know, repairing. And then at around 16 hours to 24 hours, we see this very rapid disappearance of the neutrophils. And we see them migrating into the vasculature. Now, they need proteases, and Suzanne Norshark was the first to describe this. They need proteases like cathepsins to, to actually be able to get out of the vac, uh, back into the vasculature. And so when we use the cathepsin C knockout, which has a number of proteases that can't be activated, the cells couldn't leave, okay? Now, what's important about that is that now, instead of healing, we still had a big, huge injury at two weeks. So the neutrophil not only has to get to the site, but it now has to leave that site. In the last four years, we've been preoccupied with trying to figure out how is it that the neutrophil leaves these sites? Because if you think about it now, this is a really simple model, the neutrophil leaves, but in models that are more complex, that are more autoimmune-like or more continuous injury-like, for example, one of these diet-induced liver injury models, where the system tries to put down new bile ducts, for example, in blue here, these are all stem cells, progenitor cells, trying to build a new bile duct. You can see the red neutrophils. They're adherent. They sit there, they sit there, and they never leave. Remember what I told you, if they don't leave, they actually cause more injury. So they, they eventually start releasing proteases. They start causing disruption of the tissue. And under these conditions, they're actually detrimental. And so if we could figure out how to get these guys to leave, we might be a long way towards trying to solve some of these inappropriate uh, damages that we see 
uh, in various uh, diseases. Now, if we photoactivate the neutrophils, and there's very few of them that we can see, but they all, dis they all disappear from the liver within 24 hours, where do they go? And so what we found, and I'll make a long story short, they migrate to the lung and then to the bone marrow. And we've spent a lot of time imaging the lung. I've already shown you some of those images, but what we see is that these neutrophils accumulate in the lung, and then over 48 hours, they disappear from the lung, they accumulate in the bone marrow, and we believe this is where they go to die. And so the neutrophil takes this trek through the blood, through the lungs, and then back to the bone marrow. Now we've watched these photoactivated neutrophils. We find very few of them, okay, because it's a very small injury. But when we do find them, they seem to sit there for up to four hours and they seem to do nothing. And for many years, I made stories up about how this neutrophil is now on vacation. It's worked very hard, but why would we, it go to the lung? What is it doing there? And we're really trying to understand the process by which this neutrophil sitting in the lung for four hours, what happens to it? And I will tell you, and you know, I, if you have ideas, I'd love to hear them. We think that the neutrophil in this environment gets deprimed. It actually gets turned down, so it's not inflammatory at, anymore. And now it can go to the bone marrow to do, to maybe die or do whatever it is it does. The one thing that we have found is that a molecule CXCR4 which is the homing receptor on neutrophils to go back to bone marrow, there's no question that gets upregulated when they're sitting in the lung. So at least as far as we can tell in that lung, the neutrophils being instructed, it's time to home back to the bone marrow. And we believe that if we interrupt that migration back to the, uh, back to the bone marrow, then the neutrophils stick around in the lung and they don't actually go back to bone marrow. We think that they go to die in the, in the bone marrow. Now, why would you do that? Well, perhaps you just recycle neutrophils. You just send them back there and you use all of the, uh, uh, all of the proteins and everything and you just simply recycle. And that's one possibility. Uh, so, you know, uh, in summary here, neutrophils uh, actually, they go to this sterile injury. Uh, they, they do good things. They repair, they then reverse migrate and then they enter the vasculature where we think there's things that happen to allow them to go back to go on bone marrow. We don't think they kill. There's no net production, for example. There's proteases being used to actually leave this tissue, uh, not to create a lot more mess. And so, you know, the neutrophil actually, it does some, uh, some drilling, some, you know, uh, some effective uh, repair, if you will, and it is actually a construction worker when it comes to sterile injury. And so the neutrophil isn't always bad. We think that the neutrophil might help to remove debris, help build new vessels, help to repair. And obviously we're trying to understand, is this neutrophil have the capacity to do this and also kill microbes? Or are there two different types of neutrophils? Are there subsets of neutrophils? And we're working very, very hard to try and understand. We have now started doing very large injuries uh, where a lot of the liver gets injured and we watch the bone marrow and ask our neutrophils again coming back to the bone marrow. In this particular case, we have to use something called the Kakumi mice where the neutrophils in bone marrow are green, the ones in the liver are red. And I think it's pretty clear from this image that, the, that there's a very large number of neutrophils now migrating back to the bone marrow. And we're trying to understand what it is that they're doing there. Are they affecting the next generation of neutrophils so that they're now more repair-like, or is it just informing the system of what's going on in the periphery? And we're trying to understand some of these things. I will tell you one fascinating observation we made that we still don't understand, but if we make a lesion and we have bacteria in it, the neutrophils never leave that site. They never go back to the bone marrow. We cannot find them in the bone marrow. So it's kind of interesting. The system knows it's complex, and yet this model is very, very simple. 
So these are uh, two of my boys. People ask me, what'd you do during the pandemic? I did a little bit of cloning, as you can see, and it worked out just fine. All right, so the second part of my talk, what I'd like to tell you a little bit about is the macrophage. And I am actually very intrigued by the macrophage because every single organ gets seeded by the same cell. And yet, at the end of the day, it is vastly different. So the microglia neurons, the alveolar macrophage migrate around the lung and removes uh, debris and surfactant. And the Kupfer cell manages to get into the vasculature and clear bacteria. And so we wondered about how does this all happen? And what would happen if we modified the environment? If we modified that organ, would now, for example, the Kupfer cell behave differently? And so the reason we think, and lots of people think, that these macrophages take on a different phenotype in every single organ is because that organ and the cells of that organ release different uh, molecules that then stimulate different transcription factors that then beget different uh, macrophage. And one of the best examples of this was published by Gilliams in Belgium, uh, in Ghent, where what they did was they took a monocyte, allowed it to come into the sinusoid and then watched it. And that monocyte reached out and touched the hepatocytes. That monocyte reached out and touched the stellate cell, which is really the fibroblast, if you will, of the liver. And it also touched the endothelium. And by touching all these different uh, um, cells, it got information, molecules that are secreted by these cells that activated specific transcription factor within this monocyte to allow it to become this very sophisticated macrophage. So we wanted to see this happen. We looked inside these sinusoids. We have uh, Kupfer cells inside these sinusoids, and we started looking. And indeed, what we see is that these macrophage clearly are in the vasculature, but they will send out long pseudopods touching many of the surrounding cells, okay? Now, you can only see what you image, and I'm going on sabbatical next year, and I'm hoping to actually use some higher resolution uh, microscopy to visualize how these interactions between different cells occur. Uh, but what we're pretty sure is that when these macrophages reach outside the sinusoids, they come into contact with all kinds of different cells. Not shown here is the stellate cell, the, that fibroblast or the eto cell, if you will, that stellate cell that lives in the liver. And here's what it, and, uh, and uh, I'm just gonna skip this bit. And this is what it really looks like, okay? This is the stellate cell, okay? And it actually reaches out, okay? And it actually uh, reaches and connects and, uh, and interacts with the Kupfer cell, okay? And so now the question is, okay, who's touching who? Well, the red are the Kupfer cells, the blue are all the stellate cells. And what you can see is that you, you have these, uh, these red cells touching blue cells. We have all these imaging software that tells us with a 3D reconstruction that this Kupfer cell is definitely touching these blue stellate cells. In fact, in this snapshot, only this cell is not touching another stellate cell. So clearly these macrophages reach out and they touch all the different uh, cells that tell them to be Kupfer cells and that tell them to catch bacteria really, really well. I'm sorry, I skipped a few slides. So I'll just go back here and just tell you about this. So <clears throat> these are the Kupfer cells. You add bacteria, they catch bacteria extremely well. I've already shown you this, but I wanted to show you again how effectively they catch these bacteria. And the reason they can do that, and they can do that better than any other macrophage is because they have certain receptors. So if you take a look at the liver and you inject five times 10 to the seven Staph aureus, the majority of it ends up in the liver. And the reason why is because 
under these conditions in the vasculature, the Kupfer cell now begins to express a molecule, a complement receptor called Krig. All these other complement receptors are not very good at catching, but this molecule Krig is exceptional at catching under shear conditions. As those bacteria are whipping by, this is the molecule that catches them. These other guys, they're good at catching bacteria under static conditions, but not under flow conditions. And this was first discovered by Menno van Luker and Campaign. He discovered this, published it in Cell in 2006. And we think it's a very important uh, observation, a very important discovery. We work with them to show that if you deplete all the Kupfer cells, then nobody catches any bacteria in the liver. If you don't have Krig, you don't catch bacteria in the liver. <laughs> now, I've already shown you that these, these structures can occur. They reach out. They touch different, uh, different cell types. They touch all these stellate cells. And now we know that the Kupfer cell is interacting with its external environment. Well. Moritz Peisler came to me and he said, Dr. Kubes, this is all very, very interesting, but my patients look a little different. They aren't six week old mice. My patients live somewhere on this scale where they may have had some fatty meals, they have taken some uh, drugs, they drink alcohol. And so they have a little bit of cirrhosis. Okay, or maybe they have a little more cirrhosis, or maybe they have a lot of cirrhosis, but they certainly have some scarring in their liver. And Moritz wanted to understand what happens when you start getting scarring to those Kupfer cells. And so what he did was used a very simple model. And I come back to this. If this is a really simple model. You feed the mice a little bit of carbon tetrachloride. They absorb this reagent and it kills hepatocytes. So you now start killing hepatocytes and you give it to them three times a week, every week. And by eight weeks, there are spectacular changes in the liver environment. So these are the butyl as you can see here. And what you see here is a little bit of autofluorescence because you have some dead and dying cells. And now because the sinusoids are so tiny, they've sort of shrunk almost, you have to start building larger vessels to accommodate all this. And so the vasculature looks something like this. This is a healthy mouse. This is a fibrotic mouse. You can see tiny little sinusoids and these very large collateral vessels running right through the liver, running around the liver. And this now uh, uh, accommodates much of the blood flow. So shrinking of the sinusoid, large collateral vessels. So now the question is, why is that happening? Well, we think it's happening because you now get this fibrotic scar. So this is just, uh, just labeling for collagen and you get this scarring. This doesn't do it justice. This is just histology. When we use our two photon microscope, what we see is that every single sinusoid is now covered in collagen. So we now have all this scarring around each and every single sinusoid. Okay. And so now what you've got is the Kupfer cells inside these very fibrotic channels. You've got Kupfer cells stuck. Okay. This is not my dog. I'm not mean to dogs. Uh, I'm just trying to illustrate the point that this guy probably doesn't know what's going on over here. He's stuck. And the same way our Kupfer cells now, the environment causes them now to become these long elongated cells that can no longer reach out and touch their environment. And so now when you look using that imaging software, who are they touching? Well, they're not touching those stellate cells, the blue cells anymore. And so the majority of your Kupfer cells are now yellow. They're no longer interacting with their environment. And so remember Guillaume's paper that said these cells have to touch hepatocytes, have to touch stellate cells. We're now seeing them not touching. And so the question was, will they lose their identity? And the answer is, yes, they do. In fact, they quite profoundly lose a lot of their molecules that are so very important for them to catch bacteria, Krig, 
More than 40% of these group four cells have no Crig on them anymore. They've lost all of their TIMP4. And so while, as I'll show you, it's still the Kupfer cell, they're losing their identity. They're losing what makes them a Kupfer cell. Now you may say, well, hold on a second. This is just monocytes coming in. And so you're looking at monocytes. You're not looking at the Kupfer cells. Well, that's, that, it's a good point made by all three reviewers. And so we went back and we collaborate with Florent Genoux and we use this MS483 mice. And what, we, uh, what this mouse does is it tells you, is the macrophage in a tissue a fetal origin or is, has it been made from a monocyte? And so you can see in the liver, which is the important one here, no monocytes under normal conditions ever come in and replace Kupfer cells. And so we then looked and indeed what you see is these purple macrophage, the Kupfer cells, none of them are red because none of them have come from monocytes. You can see the red monocytes, but they are just traveling through the sinusoids. They are not replacing the Kupfer cells. During our fibrosis, what you see is areas that are still chock full of Kupfer cells, and yet these cells no longer are expressing Krig. They're no longer expressing TIM4. There are other areas where there's some monocytes coming in and replacing the Kupfer cells or adding to the Kupfer cells, but in the end, uh, they too are no longer Kupfer cell-like. So the whole liver, because of the environmental change, has now changed its macrophage population. So here it is here, the Kupfer cells that did not come from monocytes, they lose TIMP4, they lose Craig, so they're losing their identity. Now, if you look at them, these sausages are no longer very good at catching them. And so you have this system that evolves in response to the environment where the identity is lost and the function of these cells is also lost. So <clears throat> in the last few minutes, I'll tell you that the immune system is complex and it finds a way of adapting. And so Moritz came to me and he said, Dr. Koops, I inject five times 10 to the uh, seventh bacteria. That's enough bacteria not to kill mice, but boy, are they sick. And when I do it to my mice that cannot catch bacteria, when I do it to the fibrotic mice, at best, I get 20%. I can't even show significance here. And the liver is still catching a lot of bacteria. And so, you know, as any good supervisor that doesn't know the answer, you then become philosophical and you borrow from your favorite uh, Hollywood movie. And so, as you know, if there's one thing evolution has taught us, it's that life finds a way. I don't know what he meant. He doesn't know what he went, meant. But in the end, life finds a way. And that's exactly what happens here. So monocytes do come into the injured liver, but they're adhering in a different site. Normally we have Kupfer cells here in the sinusoids and these large vessels are normally devoid of any Kupfer cells, okay? That's a healthy liver. In an injured liver, these large, large vessels that now form become packed with monocytes. It's just incredible how many of these green monocytes come and adhere in these uh, large uh, vessels, these large collateral vessels. They become F480 positive, so they're starting to take on macrophage-like phenotype. And then we saw the most amazing thing. They start forming these giant clusters, okay? And so you can see them here now. That right there is a single Kupfer cell. So you can see the huge size of these clusters. This is probably 20 to 30 cells all come together and form this very large cluster. And these Kupfer cells, catch bacteria better than anything we have ever seen. So as the bacteria go through this large vessel, this poor Kupfer cell cannot catch anything. But these giant cells that have formed are now removing all the uh, vascular bacteria. And so Moritz as a good German called these uber Kupfer cells, super Kupfer cells, if you will. And these Kupfer cells 
uh, are a multinucleated cell, a very large cell, expressing lots of that molecule, Crig, which allows them to catch bacteria. <clears throat> the stellate cells move away from these sinusoids and they surround these large vessels. And so it's quite likely that they are now imprinting on these monocytes to become these large Kupfer cells. And we're working on this, trying to understand how this all happens. So you can see a giant cell here. You can see all the stellate cells. You can see them completely surrounding this area. And so there's again, communication possibly between the Kupfer cells, the stellate cells, and these, these uh, giant cells have taken on a very profound Kupfer cell-like phenotype. They're giant, they form these multinucleated uh, um, uh, cell structures. I will tell you, honestly, we fought back and forth with the reviewers about whether these were a single membrane or were they fused, were they you know, just clusters? And in the end, we call them syncytia. Uh, and we just simply showed that there's multiple nuclei. There seems to be a membrane around this. But if you take a CD45.1 and CD45.2 bone marrow, stick it in the same mouse, you can see that there's some blue, some red, some fused purple. So it's hard to say that it's a single giant cell, but it sure looks like a structure that is starting to become a multinucleated giant cell. So this is the normal system. Bacteria get caught by Kupfer cells. If you now change the environment so these Kupfer cells can no longer function properly, this would never work very well if you had a single Kupfer cell in these large vessels. They just can't catch the bacteria. And so life finds a way and you get these giant cells form and they catch the bacteria just fine. Now, <laughs> reviewer number three was a handful this time. And he or she said, your model's wrong. And so at first we got very upset about this. You know, I replied with uh, this famous quote, all models are wrong, but some are useful. That didn't go over very well. And in the end though, what I think was important was that what the reviewer was saying is that this doesn't happen in humans. And so we went to three different transplant centers and each of the centers, the pathologist said, oh yeah, there's giant cells in the uh, fibrotic liver. We know that for sure. Sent us beautiful stainings of these giant cells in cirrhosis, giant cells here showing in, uh, from Berlin. And, uh, and it didn't really matter where these, what, what the disease was, whether it was viral, whether it was alcoholic, whether it was diet induced, they form giant cells. So the same program gets activated in these mice to form these giant cells when you get fibrosis in the liver. And I'll come back to this viral bit because I think it's important. Now, how could this possibly happen, right? In fact, the reviewer said, this is impossible. Uh, this is theoretically impossible. And so Robert Hanline said, everything's theoretically impossible until it's done. And so we were seeing this and I assume the reviewer meant, well, how is it done? How does this happen? And so we found a fair bit of rank L on the surface of these macrophages. This is the molecule that causes fusion of macrophage in the bone marrow. So we were certain that that's the process by which this was happening. And sadly enough, that data was all negative. So we went to this database that was uh, initially done by Neil Henderson it's a single cell uh, RNA sequencing database of fibrotic liver in both the human and mouse. And we looked for molecules that might be important in the fusion of these giant cells. And in the end, we came up with a number of molecules, CD44, CD9, and CD36 were the most upregulated. I will tell you that CD9 did absolutely nothing. CD44 was important in recruiting monocytes. And as I'll show you, CD36 was actually the molecule that caused the fusion and clustering of these cells. If you had a CD34 knockout, what we saw was that these cells came in, but then they kept their individuality, they didn't form the clusters, and now you couldn't catch bacteria properly. And so clearly, clearly this is, uh, uh, this CD36 is important in allowing these structures to form. Now, 
These patients that have fibrosis, they have a very leaky bowel. And so the question was, what's stimulating this whole process? Why are the monocytes going to these large vessels? Why are they adhering there? Why are they forming these giant cells? And so our hypothesis, and we got one right for, for once, was that these microbial products were actually going to the liver, stimulating these uh, vessels and causing the recruitment of monocytes. And so we looked inside our germ-free facility for guidance on whether this was actually happening. What we saw was that these giant clusters that were forming simply did not form in the uh, in our germ-free mice. In fact, we didn't get recruitment of monocytes into these vessels. So the germ-free mice were totally uh, and utterly devoid of recruitment into these large vessels. And, and uh, we also replicated this with antibiotics if you don't like germ-free mice. And so we think this is a common pathway when you get fibrotic liver. Now, we've probably not adopted this because of the last few generations of too much eating fatty steak or too much drinking. We think, though, that we've lived with viruses for millions of years. And it's probably the fibrosis induced by viruses that allows us to survive and be able to still fight infections until we can reproduce and we can have progeny and then you know all hell breaks loose. But people live with fibrosis for many, many years without dying of infection. And so we think that this is an evolutionarily driven system to allow us to form these giant cells to fight infections. Just in the last slide, I'll tell you that what we've done is we've taken these mice of car off of carbon tetrachloride and things regress very nicely back to near control levels. And we're now trying to understand in this liver that has gone through this fibrosis, can we return things back to normal? Will the Kupfer cells become Kupfer cells? Will the vasculature regress? Will we get stellate cells moving back into place? Or is this patient now forever in some way compromised and the next hit becomes a deadly one? And so that's what we're studying now. And you can see this nice patchiness of some monocyte-derived macrophage, some fetal liver-derived macrophage. And so the system is really quite dynamic and, uh, and we still don't understand why we get this kind of patchiness. I'll stop there and I'll be happy to address any questions you may have uh, for me about all of this work. Thank you very much.